so we've just talked about that group of drugs called the biologics. And now we're going to talk about the little bits and pieces that we have to do before we ensure that the patient receives the drug really safely. Um, and that means kind of reducing the risk as much as possible. There is no such thing as zero risk. It is all about all a case of weighing up risks against benefits. And we always try and ensure that there is overwhelming benefit for the patient with some risk. So, Mel, what what are the risks? That what are the big things that we talk to the patient about? Well, we've already mentioned in the previous in the previous uh, cast that yeah. uh, we're tinkering with the immune system. We're altering how the immune system works. Yeah. So, one of the main risks with this medication is um, to do with your immune system. Yeah. Generally, our advice is to follow the general government advice that they give out for immunosuppressed patients, although technically you're not immunosuppressed in that way with these medications, but um, uh, there's general advice out there, and that includes things like avoiding raw eggs or raw milk, which is milk straight from the cow, unpasteurized food. So what is, why? Mostly because um, if you become unwell with something such as listeriosis or okay. something that's in those medications, you can become very unwell. Because your immune system is Because slightly. your immune system is, is altered. Yeah. Um, the, uh, as I've alluded to already previously, and we will go through in much more detail when we talk about this with patients in clinic, that uh, you do need to avoid taking the medication when you've got an, another illness, such as a cough or a cold, the flu, uh, an abscess, a dental abscess. When it's forming, you should not certainly have this drug yeah. done. But you can move the medication doses around a few days here or there just to be able to accommodate that. Um, we do a lot of screening to make sure that it's safe for us to give you this drug to, because one of the things that these drugs stop is that your ability to make um, antibodies to viruses not as good as it previously was therefore we have to make sure there's certain viruses already on board so we will be checking that before you start and we'll go and we'll also be asking you certain direct questions about those sort of okay. uh, viruses. So we'll come to the screening a uh, bit uh, yeah. later but then what's it like in living with these drugs like when you give people these drugs what do you tell them what do you ex- you know, do they just you do a whole bunch of injections and say good luck, put that in the fridge, or what? <laughs> no. So, um, if you are, if you do end up picking a medication that you can do yourself at home, um, although these are injections, it's important to realise that it's not every single day. Um, it can be every other week, or you know. So follow the dosing schedule. Yeah, follow yeah. the dosing schedule. Are they usually schedule. kept in the fridge? They are usually kept in the fridge. Ones yeah. at home are kept in the fridge. Okay. If you are coming into the hospital to have an infusion, yeah. obviously we'll take care of storing the medication, making the medication and giving you the medication while you're with us. Um, at home, if you are keeping the medications in the fridge, it's important that you've got a thermometer or you can actually okay. in the fridge. So you can actually make sure that your fridge is within a certain range between two to eight is where we like to keep the fridge temperature. Um, taking the medication out the fridge just before you inject it as well, that can help with stinging. So decreasing the sting. Um, you can take it out of the fridge about half an hour before you want to inject it, just to bring it up to room temperature. But not in direct sunlight and not on any radiators, heating radiators or anything. Okay. They're a bit like uh, Goldilocks. They don't like to be too hot or too cold, okay. these uh, molecules. Okay. <laughs> but of course, if it's, if it's an infusion, yeah. uh, do, do, do patients come into our infusion suite and, and sit in that comfortable chair we talked about they do. And, then, and then get that? Do, uh, uh, is, is there sometimes... Can people come out to you and give you the infusion at home? Very rarely, yeah. okay. yes. Okay. We don't tend to do that now. Mostly it's uh, injections at home, but a nurse will come and train you how to do that. Okay. Before you have, going back to what I was saying about uh, infections and things, before you come into the infusion unit, you will always need to ring up the infusion unit to say that you're fit to have the infusion. And that means that then the infusion will be ready when you're there. Okay. We can't not talk about, before we go to screening, vaccines and yeah, stuff. Definitely. And because they're all the rage at the moment for obvious reasons. Do you want to tell us about interactions, what to be aware of, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so um, 
we do recommend that you receive the annual flu jab and the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, okay, what about the V vaccine? <laughs> the vaccine. Yeah. The COVID-19 vaccine is safe to take with the medications okay. that you will be on. And um, we do recommend that when is that av- when that's available to you and you do get called up to receive the med- to receive the vaccine. It won't interfere with your infusion. And um, if you find that your infusion or your injection date is on the same day, um, like I said, the the medication itself can make you feel slightly under the weather, but so can also the COVID-19 vaccine. Sure. Um, so if you want to try to mitigate or lower that risk, you could maybe just move your home injection to one day before or one day after, depending okay. on when your COVID vaccine is. But you can take them on the same day. They aren't going to interact. It's just you might feel slightly more flu-like okay. if you do keep them on the same day. So we, we then come to the, to the thing of screening. How do you ensure that the patient's getting maximum benefit and minimum risk. You do this thing called screening. A few simple tests to make sure that nothing, you know, there's nothing lurking in the background. Mm -hmm. I can think of things like TB and other things. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do you guys do? So we see everybody before they start the medication and uh, we will be talking about the particular medication with that patient at that time. But then we will also be asking them um, the history of any contact with TB. Um, it, all these medications have the potential to wake up sleeping TB. So we need to make sure that there's no evidence of that in the body. So that's what a lot of our screening is. And that's why we do a particular blood test on that. We also do check that there's already antibodies to certain viruses on board, mm-hmm. such as chicken pox and glandular fever. Um, and uh, we do a general health check as well. So we'll ask things like uh, about clotting history and things that will be relevant to these medications, but that will be done in the room with the nurse. Okay, sounds quite basic. What about chest x-ray? We do a chest x-ray for patients who are receiving anti-TNF drugs, that's infliximab and adalimumab. That's because those ones have the most direct link with uh, reactivating Sleeping TV, uh, sleeping TB. Okay. Um, but we don't do chest X-rays with the other uh, medications unless there is something in their history that leads us to think that. Okay. So we've discussed, we've discussed risks. Talked about living with the drugs, uh, the import, you know, the, the vaccine thing, and uh, what simple measures we take um, that will avoid uh, unnecessary risk. And that's screening. So for our, uh, we'll go forward in our next little uh, film, talk about those drugs separately. Do you want to add anything uh, before we conclude? Yes, I think there's one thing to say really, is that uh, this group of medications is relatively new, the new kids on the block. They've really only been around for about 20 or so years. Yeah. Because of the way they work, there is some concern about them having um, an in, uh, carrying a slight risk of increased slight increased risk of lymphoma, uh, which is definitely something we know with some of our other medications, such as azathioprine that we use in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, We don't know that this risk definitely goes with these medications, and we actually feel that the benefits of using these drugs outweighs that risk, which is why we're willing to offer these drugs. It is mentioned in all the leaflets that you'll see about these medications. And we have patient registry, and we have thousands of patient years now, and it's looking good, isn't it? It is, yes, yeah. but we just can't say that there is no risk, but obviously no drug says that anyway, does it? Yeah, and to be really clear, we never embark on this you know, pharmacological or therapeutic avenue without taking into account all the risks and benefits. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thanks, gang. Thanks. Thank you very much.